Hello, everyone, and welcome to part one of the 2021 Shoreline Management Webinar Series, hosted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the VIMS Center for Coastal Resources Management. My name is Karen Dury. I'm today's webinar host. Sally Brooks, also from VIMS, is helping me with webinar production. VIMS hosts annual workshops for the shoreline management community with funding support from NOAA and the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. Today's webinar will focus on tidal marsh ecology, featuring two recent studies on this subject. Part two of this series will take place in two weeks on Wednesday, August 25th. This program will feature integrated shoreline management with discussions about new guidelines and regulation changes related to Virginia's tidal shorelines. Webinar materials from both of these events will be posted on a dedicated webpage, including the webinar recordings. All registered participants will receive an email with a link to that website when all of the content is available. Before we get started with the program, let's review how this Zoom webinar is going to work. The chat function allows you to send comments and questions just to Sally and me. This is where you can seek Zoom help, share resources, and ask general questions. We ask that you use the Q&A feature to post questions for today's speakers. There is time built into the program to answer as many of these questions as we can live during the webinar. If there are more questions than time to answer them, we will compile answers to share after the webinar event. Today's program includes four speakers. Robert Isdell and Amanda Guthrie from VIMS will start with a joint presentation about a recent study that compared natural marshes with a particular type of living shoreline practice. For those of you not familiar with living shorelines, these are engineered practices to reduce shoreline erosion using a nature-based approach. Robert and Amanda will take questions together after Amanda is finished with her presentation. Then we'll take a short five minute break. The next speaker will be Brian Watts, who is the director of the Center for Conservation Biology. He will share his research looking at marsh bird community changes over the past 30 years. Then I will wrap up the program with a brief summary of the implications that their research findings have on shoreline management decisions and living shoreline designs for both the present and the future. So now I'd like to introduce both Robert and Amanda. Robert Isdell is an assistant research scientist with the VIMS Center for Coastal Resources Management. He received his PhD from VIMS in 2018 a master's degree in biology from William and Mary, and a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of North Carolina. Robert's research interests include quantitative ecology, coastal resource conservation and management, and the impacts of climate change. His current research focus is on how human modification to the shoreline impacts ecological connectivity among tidal marshes and near shore habitats. He will speak today about a recent study that compared the ecology of natural tidal marshes in Virginia with living shoreline marshes. Amanda Guthrie is a PhD student at VIMS, also at the Center for Coastal Resources Management. Before coming to VIMS, she received a master's degree from Michigan State University and her bachelor's degree from the University of Miami. Amanda's current research focus is on living shorelines especially the role that they play in marsh connectivity and fish nursery habitat. She is also investigating social networks to determine how people make decisions about their shorelines and how their decisions influence the Chesapeake Bay's ecosystem. For today's webinar, she's going to focus on results about the fish habitat similarities and differences between natural tidal marshes and living shoreline marshes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask Robert to go ahead and join us. Thank you all for joining. Um, I am excited to be here today and uh, really fantastic turnout. This is, this is exciting, a, a great opportunity to share the results of a study that we are just wrapping up and uh, is just, just coming out for uh, public consumption. So we're, 
We're really excited to be here today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about living shorelines and uh, how we are comparing them to, to the natural marshes um, throughout the area. Overall, this was a study funded by the National Science Foundation Coastal Seas Initiative. Um, and what, what we proposed to do um, way back when was a, a five-year effort to integrate the social and ecological systems of living shorelines. And so this was a really big multi-institute project um, that uh, incorporated lots of field work, um, lots of social science, and really trying to bridge those gaps between the, the social and the ecological systems. Uh, I was tasked with integrating all of the ecological data that we collected, um, bringing it into a, a synthesis to help answer the question of how do living shorelines compare to natural fringing marshes? Um, and so we have this question because living shorelines are out there, we're putting them in. Um, they really do seem to be like a, like a good green solution um, or a green option uh, for reducing erosion while also maintaining ecosystem integrity. Uh, but the science just wasn't there yet. Um, we, we didn't have particularly large integrative um, comprehensive studies that really compared living shorelines to natural fringing marshes, their, uh, their ecological counterpart um, across a broad geographic region. Um, when, the, when the studies existed, there were frequently um, a fairly small number of, of marshes. And so we wanted to try and take a bigger, um, more comprehensive approach. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna get to present to you today. Uh, I do wanna start off by defining what we are considering living shorelines here. So, just for consistency um, for this study, what we really focused on were marsh sills. And so marsh sills consist of a constructed stone sill that's placed offshore, and then you backfill the area behind it up to um, mean low water or up to mean water with, um, with clean sand. And then you plant the low marsh with Spartina alternate flora and the high marsh with Spartina patens. So this is just a, a diagram of what that would look like. And then here's what one looks like um, in real life. Uh, so you can see the stone still out in front, the low marsh, um, some high marsh up behind that, and then, and then the bank um, continues behind that. So what did we measure? Um, in all of our sites, uh, living shorelines and natural marshes, we looked at soils. So we looked at carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and organic matter content in the soils. We counted Spartina alternate flora density. And so this particular study that I'm gonna show you now really focuses on that low marsh section of the living shorelines and natural marshes. Um, so we're, we're really focusing on Spartina alternate flora. For the benthic invertebrates, we looked at rib mussels, oysters, periwinkles, burrowing crabs, nectin, um, included seven different measures of fish biomass, crab biomass, shrimp biomass, fish abundance, juvenile fish abundance, forage fish abundance, and fish diversity. We also looked at birds. Um, we kind of grouped all of the herons that, uh, would, that we would see into a single um, category and then measured their use. So just how long were the herons using that shoreline? Um, and then we did terrapin, uh, dimeback terrapin head counts um, to get a density estimate um, at all of our sites. So where did we measure this? We looked at a total of 13 paired living shoreline and natural fringing marshes. This is really um, a very large number of, of paired, paired samples. And you can see that they were distributed um, here in coastal Virginia from um, the top of the Middle Peninsula up here um, down to the south side in Norfolk. And so uh, all of the living shorelines had a natural fringing marsh that was um, very similar in uh, in not construction, but um, in its physical characteristics, so exposure, um, size, width, et cetera, um, to the living shoreline and always within um, always within a kilometer. So, so very close proximity as well. And what this lets us do is kind of account for those um, local variations uh, between, between sites. Our, our sites also had, uh, had a chrono sequence. So we had, very young marshes. Our youngest marsh was two years old as of sampling in 2018, and our oldest was uh, 16 years old. And um, for those of you that are familiar with the region, this is also, these sites also span a variety of shorescape 
settings from urban to rural. So we had um, down on the south side, we had very urban um, settings. And then uh, we had places where you know, maybe two or three houses per um, square kilometer um, at some of our locations. So, so a wide range of shorescape settings. So here's the data. Um, I, I do not expect you to, to glance long and hard at this, um, but roughly the soils are in white, the fish or nectin are in blue, plants are green, the benthic invertebrates are in gray, and the terrestrial vertebrates are in yellow. And really, really the take home from this is, um, other than the soils, which you can see on the top left, um, everything else, the, uh, the values are very similar, whether it's liver and shoreline or natural marsh. Um, and that, that really is the takeaway um, from this. But, but we'll get into a little bit more, um, a little bit more quantitative assessment of, of this to really drive home that these systems really do seem to be performing very similarly. So how did we analyze the data? Um, I promise these are the only equations um, that you'll see. Uh, and you don't really need to, to dive into them except to know that we used a z-score approach. And what the z-score approach allows us to do is kind of get rid of the units on these. So how do you compare bird use to carbon content? Um, when they're when they're vastly different, and so what we're doing is we're looking at whatever the mean value for a given metric is at the living shoreline, subtract whatever the mean value is at the natural marsh for that metric, and then divide by their combined standard deviation. So how variable was it? And what that does is kind of create this unitless scale um, where zero means identical, um, and then by placing bounds on this, negative um, values start to indicate that the natural marsh did better than the living shoreline because that's that's our reference point. Um, positive values would indicate that the living shoreline did better. And we don't really start thinking about big um, noticeable differences until those values start getting outside of plus or minus one. Um, so the closer to zero you are, the less difference um, you would see. So what did we find? Um, for the soils, the soils at a living shoreline are just still not the same as those at natural marshes, even after 16 years. Um, so we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, uh, carbon had a z-score of negative 2.6, so very, very negative. Um, and overall, in a separate study that was led by Randy Chambers, um, uh, he was the one that really led the soils work. Uh, we're looking at um, somewhere between zero and 63 years to equivalence. So the, the, the big range on that is really a result of um, quite a bit of variability in the, in the carbon content. Um, but nitrogen, very similar, negative 2.6, and then zero to 31 years to equivalence. Phosphorus, negative 1 point, about 1 1.8, um, zero to 23 years to equivalence. So uh, these are all kind of arranged by which ones are, are coming up fastest. And then organic matter, um, negative one, approximately 1 1.9. And really, none of this is particularly surprising. Um, the way that these uh, living shorelines are built, you put in that clean sand fill. Um, and clean sand does not have much at all um, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, or organic matter. Um, and so when you start with nothing, and then you consider uh, how these nutrients um, would get into the sediment. It's just, it's gonna, a process that's gonna have to take time. Um, so that, that's really where we are with that. This is not surprising, but it does definitely um, show that this is, this is where living shorelines lag behind in natural marshes. Um, one thing to note is that the rates of accumulation for all of these do seem similar between living shorelines and natural marshes. Um, so then it's just a question of, of time for this, um, for the soils. For nectin, I am not going to spend much time on this one because Amanda is going to go into all of this in, in much better detail. Uh, but really the takeaway um, here is that there was no observable difference between living shorelines and natural marshes um, for the z-scores. Uh, so for any of these metrics, all of them were less than plus or minus one um, or closer to zero than plus or minus one. Um, most of them trended slightly positive, so maybe a slight positive effect of living shorelines, but certainly nothing that we would consider large. Um, 
So I will, I'll leave it to Amanda to, to go more into that. For the herons and terrapin, we really did see very similar use. Um, so these were visual surveys for the birds. Uh, they set up camera traps um, and then uh, would just record some uh, video and then they would watch the video and see how long different birds were, were on the shorelines. And, and really we saw very similar um, results to that. And uh, for herons and, and terrapin, um, really similar densities. We do have video of, of them using living shorelines. So they're, they're standing on them, they're basking on them. If it's, a, if it's a terrapin, we've got photos of the terrapins actually moving into the living shorelines. Um, so it really does look like they are actually using um, these created wetlands. And so that's a, that is a, a positive sign. For plants and inverts, um, plants and inverts were basically the same. Um, and and I, this is gonna come with a small caveat that I'll, that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, our Spartina values were very, very close to zero as were mussel values. Oysters were similar, periwinkles. Um, so these are little snails that graze in there. Um, and burrowing crabs were basically identical. Um, all very, very low Z scores. Uh, so, Benthic invertebrates were very similar across across these areas, um, and so that that is encouraging. One difference, and the caveat here is that the analysis for these particular numbers focuses on the entire living shoreline, including that uh, that sill structure, and so that sill structure um, is where we're seeing the vast majority of mussels and oysters in the living shorelines. If you only look at the natural marsh, um, so the low marsh section, uh, the mussels get a whole lot closer to one or negative one, um, and that's really that's really a the only result reason that it's not more negative is that um, mussels are just really variable. So at the living shoreline pair that we're comparing it to, it wasn't uncommon for there to be. Uh, 600 mussels per square meter, and then you can move just a meter to the right and have five or 10. Um, and so just that natural variation means that when we're trying to incorporate that, that pool variance um, between, the two, between the two sites, it, it kind of dilutes it to the point where you have to have really extreme differences um, between um, the living shoreline and the natural marsh to, to detect something that really does genuinely look different. Um, absolute values were consistently always lower at the living shoreline than the natural marsh if you're only looking at the plants um, or the, the, the vegetated part. Um, so it really is important that we consider the entire structure as we're, as we're thinking about um, these systems. And the, one of the interesting things here, particularly with uh, living shorelines and, um, and rib mussels, is that we know that rib mussels and Spartina alterniflora have a mutualistic relationship. Rib mussels are filter feeding, so they're pulling nutrients out of the water. Um, and in the process, they help to fertilize the um, Spartina. Um, and then that Spartina is gonna grow better. Um, they're also stabilizing the sediments and the Spartina by, by binding to them. And then the Spartina in return um, provides uh, an increased canopy um, so we're shading the mussels, helping keeping them cooler and uh, reducing dehydration um, and desiccation. Uh, and then that the denser the Spartina, the more it slows down the water. And so those particulate um, larval mussels, as they come in and they're looking for a place to stay, uh, it'll slow down that water and help them come out of um, come down and settle. So it increases settling too. So there's this nice mutualistic feedback. Um, in addition to that, we have also done a separate study that found that when you put rib mussels and Spartina together, your actual removal of nitrogen from the system, so this is denitrification, genuine removal as nitrogen gas, is greatest um, when you have them together. And so when you think about the living shoreline, you're still getting that filtering capacity that the mussels are providing. You've got similar densities when you look at the at the sill, but you've dissociated them spatially from the Spartina. Um, and so that's just an important consideration where now separately they're gonna have um, lower rates 
And because of those lower rates, um, that could have implications as you're trying to think about crediting um, for nitrogen removal potential for these systems. So just something to, to think about um, uh, as, as we go forward. Then overall, if we look across all of our metrics, um, the overall Z-score was um, just slightly negative, but still very close to zero. Um, and that really is driven by those negative, um, those negative values for the sediment um, where you can, or the soils, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. But this value is very clearly, very strongly cl um, close to zero, which, which you can really take away from that figure on the right that shows those pair level Z scores for all of the metrics um, and how they fall out. And so while the overall is very close to zero, it is important to note that uh, neither all sites nor all metrics were equivalent at the pair level. So um, for example, John's Point, which was a, a living shoreline site and it's natural marsh pair um, called Tolar, uh, the living shoreline scored a negative 1.86 overall. Um, so almost two full standard deviations lower than, than the natural marsh. Um, and that's really a result of just very, very low sediment. Um, I think those lowest values you can see for the Z-score for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus came from John's Point. Um, and then in contrast, one of the sites down in Norfolk, uh, Martins was a living shoreline, River Road was our natural marsh. Um, the living shoreline scored considerably better than the natural marsh um, down there. And so a lot of these scores really are context specific. It's not that every living shoreline was exactly the same as its natural marsh pair. Um, and then even within a given pair, uh, you can have an overall very similar score. You might have basically identical, but then if you look at the actual values, um, for example, within the Wilson's Creek pairs, fish abundance was 1.94. Carbon was negative 1.96. These average out to almost exactly zero. Um, and so, while your overall score is basically zero, it's a result of the combination of, of these different factors where some things are doing really well and some things, um, some things still need some work. So the last thing to really address here is this age question. Everyone wants to know about age. Um, and ultimately, we just don't have very strong evidence um, in this particular study that living shoreline overall um, ecological function increases with age. Um, and it's not that it can't, um, that, that is not at all what we're, what we're showing. It's, it's simply that there's not a strong, clear, positive effect here. And, and sure, we can fit a line. Um, and if you fit a line, that slope is positive. It's just our bounds around that um, very, very much overlap zero. So this is the distribution of those values on the right. Um, and you can see that, that quite a few of them are still um, possibly negative or, or zero. And if you look at the shaded region on the graph um, to the left, uh, what you can see is there's, it is certainly within the realm of possibility that that line could very easily um, be straight um, and flat. Uh, and so really what it comes down to is if you look at our, our two most extreme points, um, so our, our youngest living shoreline and one of our oldest, they have almost exact same values um, in their overall Z-score. And so what it says is that it is possible for living shorelines to achieve functional equivalence very quickly. Um, and then um, it's also possible that after quite a long time, um, seven years for some of these, they're still lagging a bit, a bit behind. So it's not, it's not just that age is the determining factor. I think we also need to consider the, the context, the shorescape context um, that we're seeing where if you put a marsh in a really natural good habitat, um, then you might have lots of opportunity for all of these other factors to, to come in and, and colonize much more quickly. Um, and so it, it, it's just a much more nuanced approach that it's not just everything needs time. Um, things can be, the process does look like it's possible to speed up. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. So uh, just to wrap it up, what does it all mean? Um, can living shorelines provide the same levels of ecological function as natural marshes? I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, I think we can very clearly show that. Uh, will every living shoreline provide the same levels of function? No, um, you've got to build them right. It's going to depend on the context. And I think it's also important to think about 
where that living shoreline is and and not just compare you know a living shoreline in a very urban area to a living shoreline in a in a very natural area and expect them to be the same um it really is context specific and then how long will it take newly constructed living shoreline to reach functional equivalence uh, it depends we we just don't know we had 13 sites which was really a lot um for a for a study of this type um but we we just need more um to really tease out whether there's a a true overall effect um uh but i think i think we can say that um it's going to be very context specific so uh you can get all of this uh we are excited that this paper will be coming out um on friday i, I was really hoping that that it'd be available today but take a screenshot use your phone whatever you want um this is the correct citation that's the article number um they're just waiting to hit hit go until friday august the 13th um but but check that if you really want to get a, an in-depth look at, at what we did. So uh, with that, I will hand it off to Amanda and um, we can answer questions together after her talk. So thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so I will jump on to the nectin part. We are referring to fish and crustacean as nectin. Um, and so, as Robert also mentioned in the beginning, this was a massive, massive project, um, and we've had dozens of people working on this, particularly the fish and crustacean part. Um, but particular thanks to my co-authors, Donna Bilkovic, Molly Mitchell, Randy Chambers, Jessica Thompson, and as well, Robert Isdell. Why do we care about marshes in the context of nectin? So nectin will use marshes for refuge and food. So the as the marshes are flooded at high tides, nectin will move into the marsh and to avoid predation from other animals. Um, also, when they're in the marsh, they're able to eat a lot of the benthic organisms and other highly productive aspects of the marsh. Then once the tide recedes, the animals have to move off the marsh because it becomes too shallow. And then all the energy and all the things that they were eating gets pushed offshore with the animals moving offshore. And then those animals are then eaten by other animals, causing this transfer of nutrients and productivity to the greater estuary. And so not only are we helping the you know, shallow water communities, we're influencing the other deeper communities as well. Um, so yes, so fish will use the marshes for reproduction. So they will go into the marsh and there's a lot of small crevices and places for the fish to lay their eggs. And so it's a great place for reproduction. And then additionally, the young, the juveniles will grow up in the marsh and they'll use the marsh for feeding as well as other predation refuge. Um, and so it becomes this collection of small juveniles that are also living within the marsh. So Living shorelines, as Robert was saying, there was not a ton of comprehensive studies of what this means for the ecological community. So people will install living shorelines because they help with erosion, because they work, they slow down the waves as the waves break onto the shore. But what does that actually mean for the community? As we do know, there are differences in the way that the living shorelines are created, as well as the natural marshes are naturally created. And so for our study, um, we specifically focused on living shorelines that had the rock sill, which slowed the waves down before they hit the marsh. And so it adds even extra protection, um, as well as we used clean fill sand. Or the, uh, so the living shorelines had the proper tidal elevation that would allow the marsh grasses to grow. And as Robert said, the, that clean fill sand um, does is slow, but will eventually reach um, equal equivalency. So the objectives particularly of the Nectin study was to assess how the ecological community changes respect to the living shoreline age. Is there any trends? Are there patterns as living shoreline ages? Um, does, how does that relate to the Nectin community? As well as what does that mean for the Nectin community when we have a variety of surrounding environments? So not only we are concerned about the surrounding environments and the age, but also the varying marsh, char marsh characteristics across these fringing marsh systems. So briefly to get into this, again, as Robert went over this as well, so we have the 13 paired sites um, across the an urban and rural continuum, um, as well as varying marsh connectivity. So we have some sites that were in highly connected environments and other sites that were in less connected environments to other marshes. For the Nectin, we sampled in two years 
So summer 2018 and summer 2019, and based off of the 2018 years, the marshes were two to 16 years um, since construction. For the nectin, there's a lot of habitat here. So we broke it up into three different sampling types. So at high tide, we set fike nets into the, into the marsh. And so you can see here, we have these wings of the fike net that gets set into the marsh. And then as the tide drains, then the marshes will, then the fish will swim into the nets. And so we're able to capture and count the fish that way. Also at high tide, we set minnow traps. So we set 10 minnow traps in general across the marsh. Um, and then that will get a lot of the animals that are foraging through the marsh surface, particularly your mummy chugs and your striped killifish. And then lastly, our third sampling technique here was seining. And so we seined offshore, inshore, towards the marsh edge or towards the rock sill. With all these different sampling methods, we're able to break out the habitat categories within the marsh. And so we have the marsh community. So these are all the animals that were living within the marsh for our sampling. Then we have the shallow water community. So those are the nectin that were swimming offshore, but also nearby the marsh. And then lastly, we have it at the site level. And so that is just the combination of both the marsh community as well as the shallow water community. Furthermore, I was able to break up the nectin categories into how they fit within the ecological community. So we have the forage base. So these are gonna be the fish that are fairly abundant and are often eaten by larger fish. And so that gets to the trophic transfer of how do these fish support the larger estuary. Then we also have the juveniles. And so this is getting at that nursery aspect of how many young juveniles um, and young fish are living within the marsh and within the marsh area. So we captured a lot of fish. Um, so we captured over 20,000 fish for both years, um, almost 800 crabs in 2018, 1,200 crabs in 2019, thousands and thousands of shrimp, um, a lot of weight. So um, 140 pounds in 2018, 120 pounds in 2019 and then 43 species total. So we got about 36 and 37 species per year, but unique species across both years, we got 43 species. So also a lot of biodiversity and a lot of um, unique species there too. So with this, I have, um, this is just sort of to map where we're at. So I said, I was gonna look at living shoreline age. And so we have three graphs here. So on the bottom, it's the living shoreline age and on the Y axis, so the, on the left side, we have the abundance. Um, and if there were a correlation with age for the nectin abundance, forage base abundance or juvenile abundance, we would see there would be a pattern in these dots. But since the dots are all scattered, we can say that there is no pattern and there is no correlation with living shoreline age and any of these abundance metrics. Now jumping into this community analysis. So I looked at the community composition for all these sites. Um, so this is not species by species comparisons and it's looking at the community um, biomass or weight and the community abundance. And so I compared these composition metrics to the site type. So that's gonna be either your living shoreline or your natural marsh, the pair number, which is just the number that links the two, and then the year of sampling. Um, and as we do know that sometimes things change over time and change based off location, we add some interaction terms across these two just to assess um, other relationships. But for this talk, I'm really only gonna be talking about site type as that's what we're most interested in to look at how these changed over living shorelines and natural marshes. Um, and again, uh, to recap, so I looked at for all nectin um, at the site level for the marsh community, I looked at it for all nectin, and then looking at the forage base, and well as the juveniles, and then for the shallow water community, looking at all nectin. And then if there was a difference due to the site type in these community compositions, I can actually pull out and determine which species were driving those differences. Very exciting, and was that the abundance metrics 
for all of these different comparisons, there was no difference in the community composition for the nectin, the forage, or the juveniles in any of these combinations. We do find that there were some differences in the biomass, but we did not find any difference. So the biomass is the same um, for the community in the shallow water community and for the juvenile community. But for the site level, we do find that there were more mummy chug or higher biomass of mummy chug, striped killifish, blue crab, shrimp, and spot at the living shoreline, yet a little bit higher biomass of silverside and bay anchovy at the natural marsh. Similar trends occur in the marsh, and there are four species here that are fairly consistently driving these differences in biomass or community biomass weight. And so with this, I went to further investigations of the mummy chug, striped killifish, blue crab, and silver side to understand what was driving these biomass differences. So I took these four species and I did a size frequency. So for all of the species that we counted, we also have length recorded. And so I was able to determine what their length was relative at uh, living shorelines, to, relative to natural marshes. And for all of these four species, there actually were differences in the distributions of their size frequency. So this is the size frequency here. So we have the size of the, of the organism, of the fish on the bottom, um, and then the abundance or the count for that size on the Y axis or the upwards axis. Um, and living shorelines is gonna be in pink and natural marsh is in blue here. And the red bar is the um, cutoff between juveniles and adults for mummy chug. And so we can see there's a fairly clear size class so we do have the juveniles have their own um, bump and then the adults have their own. And so within this, um, we're expecting that mummy chugs might have a faster relative growth rate at living shorelines than natural marshes. As you can see, the bump is a little bit skewed for the living shorelines. Next, we're looking at the silver side. So again, it's gonna be the same type of graph with the pink being living shoreline and the blue being natural marsh. And for this, the, there is a two different bumps. So we have a more abundant living shorelines or more abundant silver sides at living shorelines. And then we have larger um, silver side at the natural marsh. Then jumping into the striped killifish. So there is clearly different habitat use um, of the natural marsh and the living shoreline. And so we see much more frequent juveniles and adults at the living shoreline, as the red bar here is also again indicating the size cutoff between juveniles and adults. Next with blue crab, so we did detect there is a difference here, but there really is not a pattern to, de to discern from here. So this just might be the natural variation um, and sort of as we have a lot, a lot of information, um, it was just not able to detect a particular pattern, although there is um, statistically um, a difference in the distribution. And so recapping that community analysis, um, so living shorelines do provide similar habitat at the site level. So there was no difference in abundance, um, particularly at the site level. Then looking at it for the shallow water community. So the rock sill and the living shoreline construction does not influence the shallow water community, which is actually in contrast to other shoreline armoring techniques as bulkheads and riprap are, have been shown to alter the shallow water community and actually cause degradation for the um, fish offshore. And the living shoreline marshes actually can provide either similar or enhanced marsh habitat, um, looking at sort of the smaller juveniles or the forage base. And then jumping in more to understand what the differences are for the forage base and the juveniles. So for this, I ran two separate models for each abundance. So I had two models for juveniles and two models for forage. Um, and with the marsh characteristics model, I compared the juvenile or forage abundance to the low marsh area and the inundation duration, as well as that pair number just to have a grouping. And then also I did the same thing for the site setting. So the juvenile abundance or the forage abundance was compared to the marsh distance. So this is the distance to the nearest marsh 
So it's a measure of marsh connectivity. I also compared in this model, we also compared the abundance to the distance to the bay mouth through water. Um, and so it's it's how the, the how far the animal would have to travel if they were migrating from the bay mouth. And then and then again included the pair grouping number. So at this, um, so we, when we look at this graph here, so the values that are on the right side, so it's a positive relationship. And so as we increase our marsh, we are getting more forage base. Here, we actually have an inverse relationship. And so as we decrease our inundation, we are actually increasing the forage base. And so this is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and so we were think we looked into this further and we we're realizing that the inundation is also related to the depth of the marsh. And so when there's shallower depths, um, it was often a decreased inundation time for the marsh, but it also provided um, more access to the smaller fish and increased predation refuge from the larger fish, which is essentially due to the depth um, and access of the marsh. Then looking at the site setting, so we see here that the um, marsh distance, it's basically on zero. There really is no um, relationship with the distance to other marshes, but we do see a distance to the bay mouth. And so again, it's this inverse relationship. And so as the distance to the bay mouth decreases, so in, in this context, the closer to the bay mouth, we have more forage. And so this is related to the high salinity and access from the ocean. Now looking at these models in the context of juveniles, similar, similar results for this. So as the low marsh area increases, we're finding more juveniles. And as the inundation duration decreases, we're also finding more juveniles. But then when we look at the marsh distance and the bay mouth distance relationships, it flips. And so we do see that the decrease in marsh distance, so there's less distance to travel between marshes, which means that there are more marshes around, actually has a higher relationship with juveniles. And so juveniles are gonna be more abundant when there's more marshes around. So it's increased connectivity and increased habitat for them to go, for them to be in. And then the bay mouth distance, a fairly minimal trend here that across the whole range of our sites, um, bay mouth distance was not that important. So wrapping it all up, so we did not find any trends in time of nectin habitat use based off of living shoreline age. We did find similar abundances and for some species, higher biomass at living shorelines. So there are slight differences in habitat use, but overall it's fairly, very similar. Um, the shallow waters are also similar, which is great to find as we are adding this hard structure and changing the structures, um, but it is not actually negatively impacting any other offshore communities. And this is similar to other benthic studies that we have been doing, where the offshore community is not going to be Im dramatically impacted by the creation of the rock sill, which is in direct contrast to a lot of other shoreline hardening techniques where these offshore communities are negatively affected by the addition of hard structures. And the structural differences of the rock sill and the soils are not actually negatively impacting the nectin community. So although we do have the looser, less nutrient rich soils, it's not substantially having an effect on the nectin use. And then the rock sills, potentially actually might be creating a little bit more habitat for the species. So it can create other refuge. So if a sill is necessary, it is not necessarily bad for the community, for the, for the nectin community. And then coming back to this trophic support. So all the organisms that are feeding in the marsh, what does that mean? So they are providing, so the marshes are providing similar or enhanced support for the forage base. So these are the fish that eat in the marsh and then move offshore and are eaten by other animals. So as we just went over, um, as we have a lower inundation, we're gonna have more forage base and a larger marsh, we're gonna have more forage base. And we're gonna have more forage when there's more marshes around. And so it supports that living shorelines are able to contribute to these other marshes. Um, and the more marshes we have, the better we have as a forage base for our larger fish. And then for our nursery support. So these are the juveniles, these are the babies that are using the marshes. Living shorelines do provide similar nursery support for the juveniles, 
um, and particularly also the non-forage species were predominantly juveniles. So over 90% of these species were also in juveniles. So it's very indicative that living shorelines are supportive of young fish. Similar to the forage base, we do have lower inundation contributing to more juveniles. Um, we have larger marsh habitat contributing to more juveniles and more juveniles by the mouth of the bay or towards the ocean. So quick recap for both of this project and for Robert's work, um, living shorelines can supplement effort, efforts to create marsh habitat. Um, and so we are able to create marsh habitat through these living shorelines and potentially these living shorelines are able to adapt and create habitat under new climate regimes. So as, as Robert was saying, there are site specific responses, not everything's the same, and it depends on how much the marshes can migrate upward um, when they're trying to adapt to sea level rise. But overall, um, this has been very supportive of living shorelines being great for both um, the fish community as well as the surrounding ecosystem community. So with that, um, please email me or Robert if you have any other questions that we are not able to address um, right now. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And I'm going to go ahead and ask Robert. I see Robert has joined us again. And Robert, I noticed that you captured a couple of the questions um, and are you willing to start with some of those that you wanted to answer live? Sure. Um, so the questions are, uh, can the marshes, marsh cells be seeded to speed up the transformation? Um, how can we improve soil chemistry and designing living shorelines? Can we improve our designs? Uh, is 16 years too short a uh, period to see the benefit of age with living shorelines, especially with, reg with regard to uh, soil parameters? Um, so yeah, soils are um, very clearly the lagging component. Uh, clean sand fill um, is what we're using now. Uh, so if if there is a way to incorporate more some organic matter um, into the into the sediments, um, I think that that could not only increase the amount of those nutrients in the in the soils, but that might also help the, um, the mussels as well. So one of our our theories for why we're not seeing or hypotheses for why we're not seeing um, rib mussels in the natural or the low marsh component of a living shoreline. Um, we know that they can get there. We, we've done studies that have put out settlement substrates in the low marsh, um, and we are collecting rib mussels from those areas. So they're, they're making it there. It's just that they're not surviving. Um, and so the reasons for that um, could in part be a, a result of poor sediment conditions. And so when they're, I mean, these mussels are itty bitty, um, less than a millimeter long uh, when they're settling out. And so they are extremely susceptible to um, dehydration um, and sun exposure and things like that. And so if the sediment that where they're settling on top of dries out quickly, um, then they're also likely to die. Whereas that organic matter is gonna help retain some moisture. On top of that, right now, uh, the standard is to plant um, Spartina um, alternaflora on one foot centers. And that is just a very, sparse um, way of planting. Or, so that is, doesn't re mark or remotely resemble what a, a rib muscle would need to survive. So that very limited number of um, Spartina stems isn't going to slow the water down as it comes in. So you're not getting any of those baffling effects and helping um, particles settle out um, with those very sparse plantings. Um, so one possibility is planting in clumps. There's um, some some research that has suggested that uh, by planting the Martian clumps, it might actually, or the grasses and clumps, it might actually speed up how quickly the uh, um, living shoreline is able to, um, how, how quickly the grass is able to really take over the living shoreline. Um, but those clumps are also going to provide increased um, shade, uh, increased predator protection, um, and an increased uh, amount of settling within them. So you might be able to then um, actually attract and, and retain those living muscle or those uh, rib muscle larvae um, and kind of kickstart that process. And once they're in there, they're also biodepositing, um, they're fertilizing the marsh. And so by 
taking advantage of that mutualism that that exists, I really think that it could help jumpstart um, those sediment um, soil characteristics and and get those marshes going and um, and ultimately happier. Uh, the, that mutualism really does support a more resilient system. Thanks, Robert. And here's another question that um, sort of raises an issue that Amanda might be able to address. It's something you mentioned. Why do you suppose there's a population difference between a revetment and a sill? Right. So with that, we also have the access of the marsh. And so if we look at the full site community, um, a lot of the um, offflow of the marsh is still there. And so the that community is the shallow water community is still responding to the marsh. And so if we have hardened shorelines, um, we don't have that marsh structure. And so even though the, the fish are going to be <clears throat> offshore, they're still responding to the marshes. Um, and it also could be how the those rock cells that we used were also built low in the tidal elevation. Um, and so it provided other um, nutrient access um, for the water to flow off as well to provide that connection. And so it's really just the, looking at the full site and how the um, interplay between the water and land is affected through the riprap, but not through the living shoreline. Okay, great. And there are, there are some other questions about um, increasing carbon in our designs and, and planting strategies. And, and that was not necessarily part of this study and, and good questions um, that we can address, hopefully. But one of the questions that is asked about, again, this, the, the sediment and the carbon and increasing the amount of carbon, any suggestions of what material to increase carbon? Or has anyone looked at the sources of the sand? Are there differences in the carbon or nutrient levels from the different sources? So those are great questions um, that uh, I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. Um, I believe that a couple of the other uh, attendees, um, so Don Blakovic, Molly Mitchell, um, they are, are really our, our local resident experts on living shorelines. And I will consult with them and, and get back to you all um, with, a, with an answer as soon as I can. Great, well, thank you both Amanda and Robert. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, for their session. And we will try to address all of the questions that have been sent in to us. And we will try to provide a webinar related Q&A as part of the webinar contents. So thank you again to Robert and Amanda for joining us. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed just having a short break in between the two hours of this webinar. Our next speaker is Brian Watts. He's the director of the Center for Conservation Biology. This is a group of professionals, students, and citizens conducting research and advisory service related to land and bird species of conservation concern. The center's mission is focused on real world solutions. Their research is used to create and improve environmental policy, inform management decisions, and locate high priority lands for protection. We invited Brian here today to share recent observations he's making while resurveying tidal marshes he first visited in 1992. These marshes were chosen 30 years ago as reference sites for the marsh bird community within the lower Chesapeake Bay. He returned to specific points to check on how the marshes are holding up and how the bird community is doing. So Brian, if you wanna go ahead and turn on your video. Thanks for having me. It's actually great to be with you and to be able to talk about some of the recent uh, surveys that we have done. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, salt marsh birds uh, here in the lower Chesapeake Bay. Um, and I think what I'll do is to start um, with uh, sort of an overview of tidal marshes, and then we'll move on to the birds um, in just a moment. Um, as I think uh, most people know, the Chesapeake Bay supports um, huge acreage of uh, tidal marshes. Um, as I think most people also know, um, the Chesapeake Bay receives uh, freshwater inputs, mostly from the fall line on major tributaries and uh, saltwater inputs from the mouth of the bay. And between that, we have a salinity gradient that forms. And there are different uh, plant species associated with different salinity areas so that we have uh, different types of tidal marsh. And you can see from this tide map that uh, the distribution of salinity is not exactly uh, equal. The Coriolis effect um, drives uh, 
salt water from the mouth of the bay up the bay shoreline of the Delmarva. And so it extends uh, farther along the east bank uh, compared to the western shore. Um, and the area that these particular marshes uh, that we'll talk about today are actually located down on the southern edge of the western shore, so down near the mouth in Matthews, Gloucester County, and also over in Pocosin. The Chesapeake Bay is uh, really a magnet for water birds. It's an incredibly productive ecosystem and birds uh, from all over are attracted to the bay. Um, there are different bird species that use uh, tidal fresh marshes, brackish marshes, and salt marshes. And they occur in different times of the year. We have uh, resident birds that spend the entire year here. We have migrants that come through that are in short periods during either the fall or spring. And we have birds that winter here uh, in the marshes. So maybe 150 bird species or so are distributed among these different marsh types throughout the Chesapeake. And they can occur at really high densities depending on the season. So uh, the marshes here in the Chesapeake are significant to many species um, from Eastern North America. Uh, the birds that use the marshes do different things. Uh, some of them occur in the uplands and they just come into the marshes to forage. Uh, some of them actually breed and forage within the marsh. Uh, and then other birds, particularly migrants, may just use marshes for loafing. And so there's a lot of activities that go on uh, within uh, Chesapeake marshes. Um, and so the marshes play different roles for different species and during different seasons. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is really just the core breeding species that occur in the salt marsh. So there are many inter interesting things, uh, seasonal things uh, within some of the other uh, tidal marshes, but I'd like to focus um, on just breeding birds in the salt marsh. Um, salt marshes uh, form within the bay um, at within a certain salinity range, about 18 to 30 parts per thousand. So these are distributed down in the lower bay where the waters are saltier. And we have significant acreage of uh, tidal salt marshes within the bay. And they play an important habitat role for a number of bird species. From a habitat perspective, uh, we typically break the salt marsh up into two different zones. You can see across the top there that we refer to as high marsh and low marsh. Low marshes are uh, areas uh, within the marsh surface that are typically inundated daily by normal tides. Uh, high marshes are typically uh, inundated infrequently um, typically associated with lunar tides or wind tides. So uh, periodic inundation um, for those areas. Um, these two different parts of the marsh have different habitat um, services for bird species. And there are some species only associated with the high marsh and some species only associated with the low marsh. And so from a habitat perspective, we typically uh, view the marsh as uh, stratified. I wanna show you what some of these look like. Um, this is a typical high marsh scene up in Matthews County. Uh, these are spectacular habitats. They resemble uh, inland grasslands. Uh, the two dominant plant species that we have here are salt meadow hay and salt grass. They are typically intermixed within the high marsh. And the species that we associate with this particular habitat um, are similar to what we can see in inland uh, grasslands or meadows. Um, an example of that would be the eastern meadowlark, which nests commonly in pastures and open grasslands. They also have historically nested in the high marsh. Um, so the profile of the habitat is quite similar. In the low marsh, there are two dominant plant species. Um, this is smooth cordgrass, also up in Matthews County. 
these oftentimes form monocultures. Um, uh, this is the tall form of uh, cord grass. We also have some shorter um, forms that form habitat of this particular plant species. Uh, once extremely abundant in the, the lower uh, bay. There are a number of species that are associated at different times of the year with this particular plant species. Uh, some of them use the seeds, some of them use the cover that they provide or the prey species that are associated uh, with this plant. The other plant that we see that dominates the low marsh is black needle rush in the lower bay. Um, this is a rush species. Um, that historically has been sort of co-dominant. They occur in dense patches um, within the low marsh. And some of the species that are associated with cord grass are also associated and can use this particular plant species. So both of these species, the cord grass and the needle rush are um, tolerant to daily inundation. And I wanted to show you what the, um, the land marsh transition or the ecotone uh, looks like uh, historically. So historically what we have had is that the high marsh um, extends up to the boundary of the maritime forests um, that occur around the bay. And what you can see um, is this type of configuration where we have the marsh grasses that extend up. You typically also have salt bush that you can see there that forms a band around the high marsh on the upper end. And then as you move into the maritime forest edge, we typically have wax myrtle. And you can see that in the background there. You can also see over to the right, some red cedar. Red cedar is also a very common plant um, associated with this ecotone. Okay, what about the bird community? I'd like to give uh, some brief overview of some preliminary results of surveys that we have uh, just completed about two weeks ago. And something about this particular uh, survey study, um, as Karen said, uh, the marshes that are included in this were actually selected back in 1992 to be reference uh, marshes for the lower bay and to you know, survey to characterize the bird community and then to reevaluate that bird community moving forward. And so this complex of marshes was surveyed in the spring of 1992. And we have just finished uh, surveys in the 2021 breeding season about two weeks ago. Um, the initial uh, <clears throat> network of marshes included about 20 marshes. Um, they varied in size from less than a hectare um, up to about 100 hectares. One of the interests early on was the influence of patch size on the marsh bird community. Uh, this latest resurvey um, this particular year uh, only looked at the marsh patches that were uh, five hectares and above. And so we have three categories of patch size, five hectare, around 10 hectare and then above 60 hectares. The larger marshes were considered controls that we hope to contain the entire marsh bird community. Um, the way that these were surveyed is to use um, 30 meter fixed radius plots. And so the idea is that an observer would stand at the center of the plot and record all birds detected within the 30 meter radius of the center point. Um, and so within each marsh, there was a, a network of points established. Um, they varied based on patch size. There were about eight to 10 um, points established in five hectare marshes and 28 points established in the larger uh, 60 plus hectare marshes. And so throughout this network of marsh patches, um, the network was actually 186 uh, survey plots. These same survey plots uh, that were surveyed in 1992 were surveyed in this past year. So they were the identical um, plots, centers, 
um, that were surveyed. These, this network was surveyed uh, in four rounds in 1992 and four rounds this particular year. There were two rounds of survey conducted between mid uh, May and mid June, and then two rounds of survey conducted between mid June and mid July. And so uh, a comment on sort of what's happened in the intervening years. Um, we are in the preliminary stages of analyzing this data. And so I'm only going to show you one parameter or metric. Uh, there are a number of metrics that we'll ultimately look at, occupancy, colonization, uh, et cetera. I am going to only show you uh, a general density metric. Um, but before that, I'd like to mention uh, this particular cluster of species. Um, this group of species is associated with the high marsh, and these are species that we have lost in that period of time. Up on the upper left is the Henslow sparrow. Historically, we had a um, uh, subspecies of Henslow sparrow that was a unique to the marsh upland uh, ecotone. Uh, we have not now had Henslows in Virginia, that particular form, uh, since the early 2000s. Um, the one in the center there is the eastern black rail. This is also a form associated with large expanses of high marsh. Um, this bird hasn't been detected in salt marshes in Virginia since 2014, and it has undergone uh, a near range-wide collapse. I should mention that the Henslow uh, salt marsh form is now believed to be extinct. So it's been extirpated in the last couple of decades along the Atlantic coast. Uh, the one in the lower right there is the sedgeran. Um, this species uh, occurred in some of the study, the large study uh, patches in 1992, um, but was not detected uh, this past year. Um, this species, um, similar to the Henslow sparrow, occurred uh, along the um, marsh upland ecotone in the shrub band that is there. And um, they have suffered similar to Henslow sparrow. There are some other species that have also been lost. I mentioned the eastern meadowlark that commonly nested in the early 90s in the high marsh. Um, uh, that species no longer occurs there, although it continues to occur in upland grasslands. So I wanted to focus on just four, four species that we consider to be core uh, salt marsh uh, breeding birds here in the lower bay. That includes the clapper rail, the Virginia rail, the marsh wren, and the seaside sparrow. And if we look at those collectively um, in our point data and compare 1992 to 2021, um, you know, we have seen an over 40% reduction in um, detection density. So what we see in this particular graph is birds per hectare. So these are birds that were detected uh, within the 30 meter fixed radius plots. And that data was then um, standardized to birds per hectare. And so you see that in the uh, early 1990s, we had over 17 birds, just of these four species uh, per hectare, and now we're down to below 10. So we've had a decline uh, in these four uh, birds collectively um, over that 30 year period. Um, what I'd like to do now is to look at these individual species and see how individually they're faring um, this is the clapper rail. The clapper rail um, occurs in its highest densities in the low marsh, but it also occurs in the high marsh um, parts uh, of patches. This particular species has held up um, the best of the four core species. You can see that we haven't seen a decline um, uh, over the 30 year period. In fact, a little bit of a bump, but there's no significant difference between um, these two time periods in terms of clapper rail densities. Um, we may see something slightly different if we look at occupancy. Um, my sense from the surveys is that um, 
these birds um, have become more concentrated in fewer marshes and they occur in higher densities within those marshes that they still occur compared to 1992. And so there may be some changes in distribution, but in terms of the entire network, um, we don't see a difference between the two periods. This is the seaside sparrow, which uh, historically and uh, continuing is the species that has the widest distribution in the lower bay and also has the highest density, breeding density uh, in the bay. And you can see that we've had about a 30% reduction, a significant um, reduction between 1992 and 2021. Um, and I would say um, uh, that this particular form has also shown a change in distribution similar to the clapper rail, where we see them holding up in particular marshes, even though they have been lost entirely in some of the other marshes. And so on balance, um, you know, the density has declined, but in some marshes, um, we, have, we have lost this particular species um, as a breeding form. And this is the Virginia rail, um, which uh, over the 30 year period has experienced a catastrophic collapse. So this is a significant um, decline in density. And this particular form is pretty much restricted to the low marsh. So they don't typically use the high marsh. They're in the dense vegetation in the low marsh. And over the past 30 years, um, uh, in the early 1990s, they were widespread in the low marsh across this network of marshes. Uh, um, currently, they occur in only a couple of pieces of those uh, marshes that were surveyed. So they have um, shown a significant contraction over the 30 year period. And lastly is the marsh wren, uh, which has also shown a dramatic decline over the, per the 30 year period. This particular form is also restricted to the low marsh. Um, historically, they have been most associated with nice continuous stands of tall Spartana. And so um, they have um, experienced a significant decline in density um, over that period of time. I don't know how completely I can discuss causes at this point, but what I'd like to do is um, mention a couple of observations um, over the past 30 years. Uh, in terms of how the marshes have changed, um, there are a couple of things that we see with the marshes um, today. When we look back in time, um, there have been uh, obvious physical changes. One of those has been marsh erosion. This is a marsh up in Matthews County. Um, and this is where one of the points uh, was located. This was marsh back in 1992. And now it's effectively a mud flat at um, low tide that you can see here. What you can see there in the center is uh, remnant peat. So that peat would have supported the marsh that was there previous. Um, this erosion begins as a scouring. You can see in the inset down on the lower left that the marsh um, initially is scoured uh, in some storm event, and that just continues to uh, deepen and uh, widen. This particular eroded patch here on this marsh is a couple of hectares in size. And so one of the reasons that these birds have shown a decline is because of physical changes in the marsh like this. This was a point that would have supported um, seaside sparrows in 1992, and now the habitat um, has been eroded away. Similar to that is um, this sand overtopping. This is a marsh up in Matthews County that um, in 1992 had a small sandy beach, and it also had a fairly high sandy berm. That sandy berm was protecting the interior marsh um, from uh, storm events. You can see now that that berm has been overtopped and has been pushed back onto the surface of the marsh. So this is a location of another survey point uh, 
that in 1992 had uh, marsh grass and now that grass is covered with sand. Both of these uh, types of physical changes, the sand overtopping and the marsh erosion um, are present in most of the marshes, maybe not to this extent, um, but it's an ongoing uh, process that we're seeing. Um, lastly, I, I'd like to mention that uh, we're seeing a squeezing of the high marsh. Um, the vegetation that you see over on the left there is Phragmites or common reed. Um, this was not present in the marshes in 1992, but what we see is that the ecotone is now drowning in uh, common reed. And so it has uh, come in along the ecotone and it is expanding out into the high marsh. Uh, what we also see is that needle rush has expanded its footprint in the marsh. And so we have these two uh, expansions, uh, Phragmites from the upland and black needle rush from the low marsh. And these are basically squeezing down on the high marsh. And so some of the species that we have lost uh, in the high marsh are due to these ongoing changes in plant composition. The last one that I'll mention, which has less to do with the physical changes in the marsh um, is tidal inundation. And so this is one of the main drivers that we think are influencing the habitat value of marshes um, as we have ongoing sea level rise and warming. Most of the species that occupy the salt marshes as breeding species are <clears throat> tuned to the lunar cycle and they tend to lay just after a spring tide and that gives them time to hatch and bring off young before the next major um, spring tide. And one of the things that's happening uh, with respect to inundation is that we're getting inundation between the spring tides. The result of that is that there is not enough time. The birds are being squeezed into a shorter and shorter period. At some point you reach a tipping where um, the interval between inundation events is equal to the time it takes to bring off young. And once you reach that point, um, it is like a tipping point or going off a cliff where you no longer have the window of time to bring off young. And we believe that this process is one of the factors that's creating demographic stress for these populations um, in the lower bay. And <clears throat> that demographic shift happens um, like this, where these marshes historically may have been demographic sources, meaning that they're producing more young than they need to offset adult mortality. Um, but once we reach this tipping point, <clears throat> the production uh, declines to the point where uh, they are no longer offsetting adult mortality and the population will then spiral down um, ultimately to extinction. <clears throat> you know, why do we have differences between uh, some of these species, uh, say clapper rail versus seaside sparrows? These are the two dominant species that we have in tidal salt marshes in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, <clears throat> we don't currently know, and we really need to uh, do some more intensive work to look at what are the differences, the ecological differences between these in terms of their response to ongoing sea level rise. <clears throat> One of the differences between them um, we can see is obvious here, and that is clapper rails have a greater reproductive potential. That's a clapper rail nest there with nine eggs. The seaside sparrow nest down below has three. <clears throat> And so it may be the clapper rail pairs, a, few, a smaller percentage of the clapper rail pairs are needed to be successful in order to offset mortality <clears throat> because they have greater reproductive potential. It's also possible <clears throat> that they are able to uh, be more resilient to the inundation. <clears throat> the nest that you can see there on the upper um, uh, image <clears throat> 
is actually a platform nest that's built within needle rush. Clapper rails are able to adjust the height of this nest. And it may be that at least within current uh, inundation heights, they are able to stay above the water, so to speak. Um, there will ultimately be a limit to this as sea level rise continues likely because above a certain height, the vegetation will no longer support the nest and the nest is more visible to predators. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm getting at is that we don't completely know what are driving the details of the demographic changes that we're seeing or the population trends we're seeing. But there's uh, several different uh, avenues um, that need to be investigated to sort out um, some of the species specific uh, changes that we're seeing. So a couple of comments. One is that um, the Chesapeake Bay supports significant marshlands. Um, these marshlands are very important uh, to bird populations um, on a hemispheric scale. There are many birds that stop over here. There are many birds that uh, winter here. And then we have our own local breeding populations that are significant um, on a national scale in terms of the size of these populations. These marshes are changing. <clears throat> uh, some of these changes um, are physical changes. Some of them have to do with changes in the plant composition. Some of those changes are significant. An example would be the marsh wren. Historically, marsh wrens nested in the tall spartina. Um, what we're seeing is displacement of tall spartina with needle rush. And um, at least here, the marsh wrens uh, don't appear to like the needle rush as much as they did the tall spartina. And so some of these plant uh, composition changes on the surface may be significant from a habitat perspective for some of these species. These changes are impacting some of the bird species, uh, some more so than others. You know, why are some of these um, being impacted more than others? Um, these are really avenues that we need to understand. We need to understand what are driving some of the uh, deep uh, declines and how is it that some of these species are able um, to be more resilient? Um, <clears throat> I think we need to understand what some of these patterns are and what some of the drivers are so that we can better understand what our management options are. Um, until we understand these relationships, it's hard for us to come up um, with possible uh, solutions that'll help with the resiliency to sea level rise. And I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Brian. One of the questions that was um, posted was, although your results in this current study are preliminary, do you have any publications of the previous studies that provides the research methods that you used for these surveys? Um, yes, there was a, a report. So the initial survey was actually a collaborative survey between the center here and the EPA and VIMS and the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. The techniques that were used in 1992 don't really, um, mirror what is sort of state of the art now. So in 1992, a lot of the marsh survey techniques had not been um, fully assessed. And so uh, we use 30 meter fixed radius plots. Um, now we use, for example, unlimited radius plots and there are different analytical techniques to analyze that data. Um, I continued with the survey technique that was used in 1992 for consistency sake. Um, uh, but outside of this particular survey, we use other um, uh, field techniques to survey. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but- It, it does. Uh, and this, this work he's talking about that just completed, the field work was just completed this summer. Um, that, that work will be published eventually, but it's, it's not yet available. Yes, it, it will be written up um, within the next couple of months and submitted the comparison, the 30 year comparison. Another question we received is about other bird studies that are going on elsewhere in the Chesapeake Bay area, like in Maryland. I know assuming these other communities are doing similar studies, could the declining birds just have moved to other areas versus going extinct? 
And are there any comparisons with like studies in other Bayside areas? Um, the Marshbird community is one that's receiving intense interest because of sea level rise um, throughout North America. I would say that the center of research over the past decade or two has been the North Atlantic or New England. Um, there has been ongoing survey work um, in Maryland. Um, and, uh, you know, we have been interested, for example, in specific species, black rail. We have a paper that's coming out this spring that looks at black rail trends uh, throughout the Bay from the late 80s to present. Um, and so, no, I don't believe that these birds, um, I don't, I believe that Maryland is suffering the same trends in terms of the habitat value of marshes that we are here in Virginia. And so I don't believe that new habitat is opening up for these birds to move and occupy to. One of the ongoing discussions is about marsh migration and the extent to which um, ongoing marsh migration may compensate for some of the losses on the outer edge of the marshes. That's a topic that we are very interested in and hope to do work in the near future. Um, it has been much discussed in terms of um, compensating for marsh surface area, but the bird habitat portion of this, as in do birds track marsh migration, um, and so we're basically getting no net loss is an open question and one that we hope to pursue. Yes, that is a, a, a great deal of interest in research of that ecotone he referenced, the, the area between the uplands and the marshes and they're changing because of sea level rise. And some of them are forested, some of them are dominated by the invasive Phragmites he mentioned and how those communities are changing and how the habitat provisions are changing is under investigation. and. We will continue to monitor the results of those studies. Another question is asking, are you using any of the community science data that's provided by bird counts in the area from citizen science projects, eBird and others that are doing bird counts, the Audubon Christmas bird counts or any other data sources for the marsh birds? Um, we have been particularly interested in uh, winter distribution of some of these species and eBird data um, is valuable for that. Um, you know, uh, I would say one of the drawbacks for this particular study, you know, obviously is that um, these marshes aren't accessible uh, typically to, to birders, so birders aren't covering these marshes. And since these were references, I'm not using it for this particular purpose. But I think that the citizen science data has great value in terms of understanding the distribution and changes in distribution, particularly on a large scale, maybe not some of these fine scale. Um, you know, an example would be uh, salt marsh sparrow. Salt marsh sparrow um, is a prisoner of these marshes um, and is projected to go extinct um, in the next three decades or so. That's a form that's likely to be federally listed. The black, Eastern Black Rail was federally listed last fall. Um, and so uh, birders have had um, a great, um, made a great contribution in terms of the distribution of black rails and salt marsh sparrows, some of these rare species that we need to understand their distribution better than we currently do. Yes. Well, thank you very, very much, Brian. Um, and now we're going to transition into my presentation and we will talk about some of the shoreline management implications. So like I said, now it's my turn. I am also with the VIM Center for Coastal Resources Management. I have been a shoreline management expert since 1989. So like Brian, I have been doing work over the past 30 years along the shorelines of Virginia and Florida. I've been involved with living shorelines also since this name emerged in 2005. I've been tracking living shorelines over the years to help understand and share how this approach can be applied successfully. I co-authored two versions of the VIMS Living Shoreline Design Guidelines, which are being amended again as our understanding changes. I also train and assist volunteers with Virginia Master Gardeners and Virginia Master Naturalists who are engaged and helping with shoreline education and management. 
Many of them are here today, and I'd like to personally thank all of you for your volunteer service to help protect Virginia's natural resources and shorelines. For today's webinar, I wanted to provide a shoreline management perspective to the research findings we just heard about. Shoreline managers in Virginia and other coastal states are now part of a movement to increase the use of nature-based solutions to make coastal communities more resilient to the effects of climate change and sea level rise. It's now well understood and accepted based on the growing body of evidence that living shorelines are part of the solution. In Virginia, living shorelines are featured prominently in the Coastal Resilience Master Plan, our Chesapeake Bay Water Quality Improvement Goals, and shoreline stabilization policies and regulations. The adverse effects of extensive armoring that Amanda referred to with bulkheads and revetments have been well studied. The benefits of living shoreline approaches that emphasize the use of natural habitats that Robert and Amanda described are also gaining a better understanding through many research studies now underway and completed and published. These scientific findings have led to changes in shoreline laws and policies around the nation, not just in Virginia, to incentivize and support more widespread use of living shorelines to solve erosion problems. Virginia's tidal wetland guidelines were updated this year by the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. These new guidelines raise the standards and requirements for living shoreline approaches in Virginia. Only living shoreline approaches are allowed unless best available science shows that such approaches aren't suitable. These new guidelines also recognize that properly designed and constructed living shorelines are vital to address coastal resilience concerns. Similar changes were adopted for the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act in Virginia that regulates the adjacent upland areas along our shorelines. These new shoreline laws and policies are going to be featured in the next webinar on August 25th. This is another map that Amanda and Robert showed you of the comparison study. There are several different types of living shoreline approaches and they only looked at one of those, the marsh sill approach. And this map is a close up view of the 10 sites that were located in the middle peninsula region of Virginia in Gloucester and Matthews County. And from a shoreline management perspective, these are rural areas. They're primarily residential with some agricultural properties. And they surround the Mobjack Bay and the York River, which are ecologically rich areas in the Chesapeake Bay estuary. Eight of the projects were on residential properties and two were located on public lands. Here's a close up shot of the three urban living sites, living shoreline sites in the cities of Norfolk and Hampton. You can see how different this shoreline management context is around the body of water known as Hampton Roads, which is home to a large US Navy base, industrial sites, and the port of Virginia with a lot of commercial shipping traffic. All three of the urban living shoreline sites are also residential properties on the Hampton River and the Lafayette River in Norfolk. Both of these rivers are currently the focus of concerted conservation and restoration efforts by the people who live around them. Robert referred to the, the settings, the, the shorescape or landscape settings of the sites that were in the five-year study. And all 10 of the Middle Peninsula sites are relatively large parcels. These are not small residential parcels. Um, and they also are dominated with natural surroundings. And they measured this by looking at the land uses within the one kilometer circle centered on the living shoreline sites. And although they are surrounded by dense urbanization, the three urban site settings are also really not intensely developed as the photos on the right show. It's kind of a, a surprising to, to go through the city of Norfolk and then come onto the shorelines of these properties and see these beautiful natural surroundings around them. Another observation that I made as a shoreline manager with the 13 sites was the relative absence of trees. These are not forested shorelines mostly. There was really only one of the sites that had a forested shoreline adjacent to the project. Most of the sites just had a few scattered trees or none at all. And for those of us involved with shoreline management, dealing with shoreline trees is a big issue sometimes. 
I've personally visited six of the 13 sites before and after the living shorelines were installed. I visually inspected field photos and permit records for the rest of them. My perspective is different from the marsh ecologists. The first thing that I look for when I visit these living shoreline sites is shoreline erosion. Did the living shoreline approach solve the original erosion problem? There was active erosion at all 13 sites, either at the upland bank or a natural marsh was disappearing. There was one case where a failing bulkhead was replaced with a living shoreline marsh. And this is an example of what we refer to as softening an, a previously armored shoreline. I'm pleased to say all 13 sites do appear to now be relatively stable with no apparent evidence of active erosion continuing. And I, that's not true for all living shoreline sites. And we've also had 20 major storms in coastal Virginia since these projects were installed starting in 2002. Two of the projects have been resilient through all of these storms. Seven of the projects have been through 14 major storm events in the past 10 years since 2011. All 13 of these projects I consider to be fairly large scale living shorelines, including the three urban sites. The total project lengths ranged from 175 feet to over 1,000 linear feet, with an average length of over 300 linear feet. The ecology study that took place, the sections that they studied were limited to smaller areas within these larger project footprints. As Robert said, all 13 of these living shoreline sites have tidal salt marshes. There were no low salinity or freshwater marshes included in this study, although there are living shorelines now elsewhere that do have freshwater marshes. Many of the sites had natural salt marshes very close by that both Amanda and Robert refer to. Some of them even had existing salt marshes within the project footprint, like the example here on the left. In situations like this, the existing marsh plants help jumpstart the planted areas by providing seed source and underground rootstock that can easily expand into the newly planted areas. Robert mentioned, and there was discussion about the difference between the soils of natural marshes and living shorelines. And we know that the sand fill used for living shorelines is not as fertile with not as much carbon content, but yet coarse sand fill is required by the regulatory agencies to minimize adverse water quality effects from finer grain material. So to answer these questions about how can we change the sediment content to improve the ecology of these living shoreline projects, we also have to keep in mind what the regulatory requirements are to protect water quality while these projects are being installed. Coarse sand is also heavier so it doesn't move away from the placement area where it's placed. Um, Robert mentioned, sorry, that all of the, um, and Brian talked about the plants in the low marsh and the high marsh. All of the planted projects in this study use the two foundation species, Spartina alterniflora and Spartina patens. We only use these two marshes to plant living shoreline projects because they are available from wetland plant nurseries and they grow and spread quickly. One of them is planted in the low marsh, the, the cord grass, and then the other one is planted at higher elevations in the high marsh. And definitely additional marsh plants do appear over time from local seed sources. But Robert explained to me that even though these projects are two to 16 years old, they're still mostly just Spartana alterniflora in the low marshes of these living shorelines with very little black needle rush that Brian just referred to that is squeezing out the cord grass in some of the natural marshes. I've also seen this happening here at VIMS with our marshes. The high marshes also continue to be dominated by Spartina patens. There are some areas with salt grass mixed in, but the planted species continues to dominate. And none of the 13 sites were noticeably impacted by the invasive marsh plant common reed or Phragmites australis. We know that at least one property owner has actively managed to control Phragmites, but this has not been a problem for these 13 sites, but it is certainly an issue at other living shoreline sites. Marsh width is an important factor for wave attenuation to reduce erosion forces 
Wider marshes have a greater distance for incoming waves, and they provide rough surfaces that reduces the wave energy. Living shoreline tidal marshes are usually designed to have gently sloped elevation gradients toward the upland that contributes to reducing the force of waves as they run up onto the shoreline. This profile may not have as much of the same kinds of micro topography differences as natural marshes, but the goal is to reduce the wave energy. In the comparison study, I wanted to point out that the range of marsh widths was 11 to over almost 50 feet with an average of 23 feet wide. And this doesn't include the saltbush zone, which also provides protection and wave reduction, especially during extreme high tides and storm surge flooding. All 13 of the living shoreline marshes had both low marsh and high marsh zones. And the average width of each of these zones was 12 feet. Meanwhile, some of the natural marshes only had low marsh because they are getting narrower as they retreat landward and encounter slope or structural barriers. And as Brian pointed out, some of them are disappearing entirely. In addition to marsh width, the number of marsh plant stems or stem density, as Robert pointed out, is important for wave attenuation, sediment accretion, nitrogen removal, and, and rib mussels. And Robert explained the positive stabilization feedback loop between mussels and marsh grasses. The plant stem density was high at all of the living shoreline marshes in this comparison study. And taller plants can attenuate higher tides until the plants are underwater. There's little wave attenuation that occurs after the plants are completely submerged underwater. Now let's look at the living shoreline sill structures. Reduction of wave energy along the marsh edge and containing sand fill are the primary functions of marsh sills. They're usually constructed where the wave heights are too great for either planted or natural marshes to persist on their own. Sills are designed to withstand the expected waves and storms where they're located. The stone size varies depending on the setting. The collective weight and arrangement in a trapezoidal shape helps prevent the stones from moving or becoming dislodged from the line. And the, this is where the engineering comes into play. Sill height and width are based on the local tide range or the vertical difference between low and high tides and also by the level of protection that's needed. One of the living shoreline design challenges is determining what size sills need to be to protect healthy tidal marshes from erosion without having significant adverse effects. Placement along the marsh edge interferes with numerous processes that Amanda talked about and it buries the benthic habitat underneath. So the sills need to be tall enough to knock down local waves without also blocking tidal flow and restricting access to the marsh for fish, crabs, birds, and other wildlife. So what about the 13 sills in the comparison study? I must say it was pleasantly surprising to find out how well the tidal marshes appear to be functioning in spite of these sills. Let's take a closer look at some of the design parameters that might help explain these positive outcomes. Tide range was about two and a half feet at all but one of the 13 sites. The example on the left illustrates how sills might appear very tall during low tides, but actually may be mostly underwater during high tides. This was estimated by looking at the color of the rocks. Lighter colored rocks generally remain dry at high tides, while darker rocks are more frequently submerged underwater. In the comparison study, they measured the height of the lighter colored rocks along the tops of the sills to estimate how many of them remained above high tides and how many were below high tides. And for all 13 of the sills, this height was less than a foot. Six of them had very small sections of lighter colored rock like the example on the right, where the sill height is noticeably increased to protect a pocket beach area. There was no attempt to measure the sill height in relation to an official tidal benchmark for this study. And we know that the current tidal benchmarks are outdated and don't reflect the actual water levels anymore. In fact, the photo on the left suggests that regular high tides seem to be occurring even above the local tide range of two and a half feet. And this is consistent with 
tide gauge data that's now showing an increased frequency of extreme high tides. Tidal inundation is an important physical process for natural marshes. The daily rhythm of the tides is what makes salt marshes such unique and diverse habitats. But tidal marshes must also drain completely during low tides. The marsh plants must be exposed during this part of the tide cycle because they can't survive in permanently flooded salt water. For this time, the comparison study, they did time-lapse photographs to look at inundation on the marsh. And these time-lapse photos, like these examples, show that the sills allow water movement in both directions through spaces between the rocks. And the plant stem density and relative health of, and vigor of the marsh plants also suggests that tidal flood and drainage patterns are similar to what we see in natural marshes. Sill openings or gaps in the sill are design technique to allow the tides to flood and completely drain off living shoreline tidal marshes. Sill openings are required by regulatory agencies in Virginia to provide access for fish and wildlife of all ages and sizes the results that Amanda and Robert presented suggest that fish, crabs, and terrapins are not completely denied access to the marshes in spite of the sills located along the marsh edges. Most living shoreline sills have openings at both ends and sometimes along the length of the project. Sill openings also help property owners coexist with living shorelines by allowing for water access and customary waterfront uses. Sill gaps are often placed where piers are located. Openings are also designed for recreation access. And relatively wide gaps like these also allow erosive wave energy. Notice how the marsh areas are curved inward behind these openings. So to address these problems, the sill openings can also be designed to be overlapping or narrow with curved ends to deflect the wave action. More study is still needed on sill openings and their effects on hydrodynamics and ecology inside and outside of the sills. Robert explained how rib mussels were more abundant on the sills than in the marshes. And we know that oysters, mussels, and barnacles will attach to sill rocks, but they, only, they also are found in great numbers in the spaces between the rocks because they're sheltered from predators, exposure to sunlight, and temperature fluctuations. So what did all of the living shorelines in this study have in common that seemed to make them functionally equivalent to their paired natural marshes? Their surrounding landscape setting at all 13 sites included natural features such as tidal marshes, including the three urban settings. All of the living shorelines had wide marshes, averaging 20 feet wide, with both high and low marsh zones. And all of these marshes had high plant stem densities. Some of the sills were large and tall, but all of them allowed tidal inundation and drainage of the marshes and openings to facilitate tidal flows and marsh access for fish and wildlife. But what about the future of these living shoreline marshes? VIM scientists Molly Mitchell and Donna Vilkovic published a paper that outlines more about dynamic designs for climate resilient living shorelines. Their recommendations include some of the same design features that we observed in the 13 studied living shoreline sites, including minimize the wave energy with wide marshes and structures that still allow for tidal inundation and sedimentation accretion, and maximize that accretion with dense plants and changing the planting strategy from rows to clusters to facilitate rib muscle recruitment for that positive stabilization feedback and provide a retreat pathway for both low and high marshes into the upland by grading the bank where possible and reserving upland spaces with compatible land uses wherever possible. And where these measures are not possible, include plans in the design for future maintenance interventions, such as thin layer fill additions, or maybe raising the sill height as water levels continue to rise. To summarize, it's more important now than ever to, remain, to protect all of our remaining tidal wetlands, not only where they occur today, but where they're likely going to be in the future. Living shoreline approaches for erosion protection are now the default approach in Virginia and other places. And there's more scientific evidence that shows they're effective in urban and rural settings. We also know that created living shorelines perform really well 
where the landscape has natural tidal marshes in the vicinity. Effective marsh sill type living shorelines are successful because they have several dynamic features that are working in combination. In order for living shoreline marshes to persist in the future, we must keep anticipating where those future habitats are going to be. And we need more studies of living shorelines and shorelines in general. And some really good suggestions came from webinar participants today. And the entire shoreline management community has a role in understanding and influencing others about the benefits of tidal wetlands and living shorelines, and also watching and sharing how our shorelines are doing over time. Um, I do want to ask if there's um, any questions from Sally. The only question that I saw come into the Q&A during your presentation was from George Blackwell. What limits the depth of the living shoreline marshes? Good question. So salt marsh cord grass that dominates in the low marshes can only grow to the mid-tide elevation. So in most salt marshes, you will see a mudflat area exposed at low tide um, after sort of the mid-tide level. And so this is something that we're studying in living shorelines. And there are some living shoreline projects where we're starting to see excessive ponding or mudflat development where there used to be salt marsh cord grasses. So that is part of the design strategy at first and something we monitor over time. I also wanted to mention that there are many, many tools and resources about living shorelines and shoreline management and climate change adaptation along our coasts available at VIMS and we're happy to find those resources for you. I want to thank again, all of our speakers that were here today. Thank you very much, Robert and Amanda for taking the questions and answering them live during the webinar. Thank you again to Brian for participating and sharing his research with us as well. And thank you to all of, um, also thank you Sally for helping with the production and thank you to all of the participants for your interest and in joining the webinar today. We really appreciate everybody's time and we hope you found it useful. So thank you again, everybody. Stay safe and stay well and have a great day.